Good evening. Welcome. It is so wonderful to see you all here, and I could not be more thrilled for this lecture tonight. Our speaker, Professor Mario Small, is one of the top qualitative methodologists in the country, an incredible, insightful ethnographer and sociologist, and I'm really excited to hear what he has to share with us tonight. And I'm going to do a proper introduction of Professor Small in a moment. I'm Naila Nasir, the president of the Spencer Foundation. And I wanted to start with just a couple of acknowledgments and a couple of announcements. So as always, none of this happens without the hard work and impeccable organizational skill of our staff, the amazing Doris Fisher, Jasmine Janicki, and the program staff. Thank you. Um, a big thank you to the Spencer Foundation Board, and especially Board President Pam Grossman. It has been a whirlwind of a year. I think you may be seeing some of the evidence of that. And we've been working really hard to think about the future of the foundation. And I'm so grateful, Pam, for your partnership in that, and to the whole board for the brilliance and the wisdom and the guidance, especially the moments where they said, slow down, maybe not all at once. <laughs> Uh, if you haven't seen it, we just launched a new website, um, so take a look when you get a chance. Uh, special thanks to Liz Carrick, who led the website development process while our communications director was out on maternity leave. And word to the wise, don't launch a new website when your communication director is out on maternity leave. <laughs> um, on the website, you'll see a bit about um, some new programming, a new large grants program, which is for field-initiated studies with budgets between 125 and 500,000 relaunching our RPP program, but perhaps even more important, you'll see that we've been thinking hard about why we do what we do, what we're trying to accomplish at the foundation, and what our goals and commitments are. There is also a cool new timeline, so if you were a past Spencer president or board member, and I see Mike McPherson is in the house, um, you can see your picture, Mike, and, and maybe even a, a, a nice quote. Um, really good to see you here. And I wanted you to know, and I wanted to say publicly, that every week, if not every day since I started 18 months ago, I figure out something that you did, Mike, to set me up and to set the organization up for success that I didn't know was important until right in the moment when I saw it. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for that. Um, one more thing before I bring uh, Professor Small to the stage. I'm really grateful you are all here for the lecture. This is like the true, these are the intellectuals. You didn't just come for the party later and the free food and drinks. Um, and so I'm gonna ask for your help with something. First, remember to bring your ticket so you can get into the reception. And we thought that this year we'd create, we're, we're trying something a bit experimental. We're gonna create a really short program in the middle of the reception. Um, so at about 8.40, we're going to pause the conversation to announce the winners of the new Spencer Mentoring Award. And so at a certain point, we're going to stop the music, turn on the mics, and that'll be your cue to stop the conversations in the room. And if you all do it first, you'll model this good behavior for others. This is super important because there may or may not be bets among the staff about whether we can get people to stop talking. And your help will be crucial so that I win those bets. Okay, with no further ado, let me introduce Mario Small and remind you that we've allowed 30 minutes for Q&A at the end of the lecture. So please use your note cards to jot down questions and hand them to the folks that will be walking up and down the aisles throughout. Mario Small is the Grafstein Family Professor of Sociology at Harvard University. His research is focused on a broad range of topics including urban poverty, personal social networks, qualitative and mixed methods, and epistemology. His work has shown that people's social networks, including how many people they know, how much they trust others, depends on the organizations in which they are embedded. So he's kind of taken the tradition of urban sociology and really infused a new kind of nuance. He is the author of numerous award-winning books and articles. His most recent book, Someone to Talk To, is an inquiry into human nature, including how people decide who to trust, a critique of network analysis, and a contemplation on the role of qualitative research in the big data era. Mario was dean of the social sciences at the University of Chicago and has served in editorial capacities on several sociological journals, as a council member of the American Sociological Association, and perhaps most importantly, on the board of the Spencer Foundation. He just cycled off this past year. 
I was a fan of Mario's work and used it in my teaching long before I met him. But knowing him and seeing him in action on the board was a great gift. He's one of those people that goes to the heart of the matter and the deep truth of a thing and always keeps what is right and good, top of mind, and always has keen insights from an angle that others hadn't yet considered. I have also appreciated his genteel kindness and generosity of spirit. Mario's current research uses large-scale administrative data to understand isolation in cities, studying how people use their networks to meet their needs, and exploring the epistemological foundations of qualitative research. His talk this evening, entitled Rhetoric and Social Science in a Pol Polarized Era, explores the intersection between evidence, research, and public discourse. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mario Small to the stage. Thank you, uh, Naila, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's really nice to be introduced by one of the most brilliant and inspiring leaders I have met. Um, today I'm going to talk about, um, well, rhetoric and social science in a polarized context. And to give you a, uh, a context for what I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to put some words on the, <laughs> it's not a board, on the, it's not even really a, a PowerPoint projector slide on the screen uh, that you've, of course, heard many times, uh, the idea of fake news. I'm not going to talk about fake news uh, itself, except to make the general point that we live in a world in which what's reported as news is often, for both political and non-political reasons, critiqued as fake. Uh, we're in a context in which news is increasingly politicized and what can best be described as political gaslighting happens all the time. Um, here I'd like to call attention to, this is the actual cover of, uh, or the actual uh, front picture of a story uh, this year in the New Yorker uh, that talked about this in its, I think, most radical uh, way, which is the extent to which essentially at this point Fox News, uh, or at least many aspects of Fox News, uh, is, let's just say, uncomfortably linked to the White House. Um, in ways such as uh, uh, political commentators being essentially advisors to the president, uh, the president taking cues from what's happening in the news, um, and even political advisors participating in rallies, excuse me, political commentators on Fox News participating in rallies uh, on behalf of the administration. Uh, really this idea of, uh, of uh, the media as an independent third party uh, check uh, on power is strongly undermined by what has happened here. But having said that, uh, this is not a talk in which I'm going to talk about how bad Fox News is. Uh, thank goodness for the good guys in the New York Times. Uh, because in fact, there's also quite a bit of bias in the traditional media as well. And this is absolutely not uh, a case of uh, uh, false equivalences. It is certainly not the case uh, that some of the uh, direct organs of the state kinds of work that have been documented in the context of Fox News have also been seen in uh, the New York Times, say, during the Obama administration. I don't think that is actually the case. But at the same time, I think it's fair to say that for a fair observer, there's fair claims of bias in the traditional media. Certainly, uh, the New York Times, as it itself has acknowledged in recent years, hasn't always been as critical of Barack Obama as it could have or wasn't always as critical of Barack Obama as it could have. Uh, some on the left and also on the right would complain that during the 2016 election, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton got way more favorable treatment than either Bernie Sanders or uh, Donald Trump, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think you get the point. Most importantly for what we're gonna talk about today, um, we, uh, I should say, the conventional traditional media, uh, by and large, including social science, failed to anticipate the Trump win. Uh, we were all wrong. And uh, you kind of see different versions of that today. We recently saw a convenient summary of the Mueller report, um, if we can call it that. And while there has been some grumblings about the fact that the convenient summary didn't capture the questions of obstruction of justice properly, I think everybody agrees that on the question of collusion, uh, the answer was pretty clear. And it was also contrary to what, if you, all you did was follow certain media, you would have thought was happening. So there are some issues. And what I'd like to do today is to talk about the need for 
in the context of fake news and all of the yelling and uh, uh, the, the infiltration by Russia into our political discourse for sober discourse that is informed by social science, not just evidence, but also thinking uh, with respect to not just findings, but also habits of thought. So what I'd like to say is that the, a lot of the work that many of us around the room do ought to be informed our political discourse, not, in the ways, not just in the ways we're used to, in the sense of reporting our findings or making our findings relevant to, the, to what we do in education, but informing the discourse through habits of thought, and particularly habits of social scientific thinking around qualitative evidence that I think are needed. And so what I'd like to say is that an important aspect, an important thing that is needed in the qualitative, in the, excuse me, in the media discourse today is what I call qualitative literacy. And I recognize that using the term literacy before a room of education experts is a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, but rest assured, um, I am referring to something very distinct and probably not what most of you study. So by qualitative literacy, I'm really referring strictly and only and very simply to the ability to understand, handle, and properly interpret qualitative evidence, specifically ethnographic and interview evidence, uh, 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 evidence or data, whether in a journalistic context or in a social science context. And uh, what I would like to say is that this is a lot more scarce than we think or say or tend to assume that it is. One way of thinking about it is to think about something that is not qualitative literacy, which is quantitative literacy. You might remember uh, that a few decades ago, there was a very strong push for increasing quantitative literacy among college students, among high school students, I and mean, that's always been the case, but there was a strong push around these issues. You might remember the book uh, Enumeracy by uh, uh, Allen. Uh, you might remember uh, the sort of strong push to, to in introduce these uh, sort of quantitative math reasoning kinds of courses as part of the basic core curricula in, in many colleges. And I think in part as a result of that, but many other factors, uh, over the last couple of decades, if you look at the conventional serious media, there's actually been a remarkable increase in the quality of the quantitative literacy in the extent to which the, the journalism and the public discourse reflect serious or better quantitative reasoning. There's some evidence of this, some examples of this. So for example, the upshot, uh, which uh, began a couple of, actually a little over a decade ago at this point, um, is a perfect example of this. This was started by uh, Nathan Silver, uh, who is a stats guy, graduate of the University of Chicago, and he essentially built a database, a large database, now I guess we'd call it big data, but a large data-based uh, and data-focused journalistic enterprise within the New York Times. Um, you can see it in the kinds of data and products that the newspapers produce all the time, even in non-quantitative context. So this is uh, from a study from a 2017 um, article in the New York Times, you might remember. I believe this was actually uh, research by uh, Sean Reardon that was funded by the Spencer Foundation, if I recall correctly, uh, where you could literally go online. You'd go online and see where your school district fell in the national distribution of school districts with respect to growth, and you could do all sorts of sort of Simple, but again, quantitative manipulations to see where you fell in the distribution. And the article, while not an advanced, sophisticated article from a social science perspective, was actually error-free in the sense that any reasonable scientist could have looked at it and say, you know, at least at a minimum, everything here is described accurately. One of my favorite sort of factoids, elements of this, has to do with how the New York Times changed how it, report, how it reported rising rents. So I lived in New York in the late 90s and early 2000s, and um, one of the things that used to drive me crazy was that the New York Times often, often, every few months there was some headline of this kind uh, to describe how, uh, how much more expensive for the average New Yorker uh, Manhattan was getting and New York was getting, et cetera. Uh, they would report increase in the, me in the mean rent, in the average rent. Uh, uh, all the time. So in this example, the average rent for apartments in Manhattan uh, below 96 jumped uh, 11%, nearly $3,000 doing et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you just paid a little bit of attention, you would know that a lot of this was driven by very, very expensive luxury condos uh, whose prices were skyrocketing 
while the prices are on the middle of the distribution, we're going up, but much more slowly. And so the headline was making a good point, but essentially exaggerated the extent to which people were actually having a harder time paying rent. Uh, same kind of story, 2017, I love it. Uh, if you can read there at the bottom, most everywhere in the United States, rent stayed the same, or went up last year, but not as much as in previous years. In 2017, the median rent across the country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Oh my goodness, thank you, New York Times. A simple fact, but again, the kind of thing that 10, 15 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, would have gone unnoticed. So I think it's fair to say, and this is, these are just examples, we could do a much more serious and quantitative analysis of this, and I'm sure you would find the same thing, that with respect to quantitative reasoning, the serious media, media have actually gotten better. But over this same period, there has not been, I argue, a parallel increase in the level of qualitative literacy in the public discourse. It just hasn't. And, and what I'd like to argue, and what is this is what I'm gonna show you today, I hope, is that our political discourse has often shown this lack of qualitative uh, literacy, this ability to reason with qualitative evidence. And by qualitative evidence, I'm specifically referring to ethnographic and interview-based evidence uh, to the de detriment of our political discourse. And that part of our job as social scientists ought to be to clarify what it is, to cultivate it, and to teach it. To clarify, for the sake of this conversation, I'm specifically talking about two aspects of qualitative literacy the kind that reflects effective reasoning with respect to ethnographic evidence, uh, and the kind that, is, that reflects uh, effective reasoning with respect to interview-based evidence. Not historical evidence, et cetera, there's a lot more, I'm just not gonna cover it today. An example of an ethnographic study, I think many people in the room know this, but just for, to get us on the same page, is Jessica Calarco's wonderful book, uh, Negotiating Opportunities, which is based on five years of observational field work. In an ethnographic study, your data are your field notes. Literally, that is what you analyze, the things that you observe. Um, Jess also did interviews, but by and large, this is an ethnographic study. An example of an interview-based study is Promises I Can Keep by uh, Maria Fallas and uh, Kathy Eden, which examined why poor, mother, well, poor women put motherhood before uh, marriage. And this is a study that's based primarily on talking to people, one-on-one. -on -one. And in that context, your data are literally your interview transcripts. Um, just to get us on the same page, these are actually very different kinds of things. People who are good in one are not always good in the other. Uh, thinking effectively about both requires different sets of skills, but there's some overlapping skills, and what I'm gonna talk about a little bit are the kinds of skills that sometimes overlap. Okay, so what is this? In order to get you a sense of, of what this is, there's, and there's something kind of, I think, important and interesting about qualitative literacy. So when it comes to quantitative literacy, everybody knows whether they have it or don't have it. Like, you kind of know, or at least you think you know whether you're good at math. I think often people say, I'm not good at math, you just had bad teachers, but whatever it is, you kind of know where you stand. You know you can't run regressions, uh, and you have a sense that there is something called <laughs> running regressions uh, that you don't know how to do. Um, <laughs> I, I hope. At least after you finish graduate school, you realize you don't know how to run regressions, right? But what's interesting is that with respect to qualitative literacy, not only do we not necessarily know that we don't know, we don't even know necessarily that there was something there to not know. <laughs> that didn't quite come out exactly as articulately as I thought it did, but it's accurate. So I'll give you an example, I'll give you a thought experiment. I give you, suppose I gave you two books, and I told you one book is an empirically sound ethnography. The other book, it's also based on empirical research, but it's an empirically weak ethnography that just happens to be very beautifully written. Could you tell a difference? What criteria would you use to distinguish the two? How would you differentiate? I'm not gonna ask you to answer, I'm just gonna think about it. What criteria would you use to differentiate the two books to determine that the second ethnographer, that they collected data and wrote a beautiful book, reasoned poorly with the data? What I'd like to propose is that being able to answer that question correctly is a form of qualitative literacy, and that it's important. That's the core idea. The difference between an empirically convincing ethnography or interview-based study, and one that's empirically weak but well written. What I'd like to propose is that there's at least three answers uh, out there. Uh, one, that's as many answers, because I think there's gonna be at least as many answers as there are methodologists in the room. <laughs> um, Two, I think for some of you, 
the answer is going to ultimately rely on some set of quantitative indicators. You're going to say, well, it's going to depend on how many years they were in the field, or how many interviews did they do, or how many hours of the interviews. And all of those things are fine. And for some kinds of issues, there are appropriate indicators. But it certainly cannot be the case that those are the only indicators for high quality qualitative research. After all, those are quantitative studies. In fact, there are excellent quant qualitative studies of one person, a single neighborhood. Many of them, actually. Paul Willis is learning to labor. I think it was 12 guys in one school. Uh, it certainly can't be just the quantitative indicators. We've got to rely on something else. I'd like us to think about what that other thing could be. And the third, I think, answer is some of you are going to say, well, actually, I'm not sure. And I love that. I think that is a starting point, if you want to think about it as a 12th step, as a path towards where we need to go. I want to be clear. Um, I don't believe that every single person, every single good social scientist, or certainly any journalist, needs to be able to uh, do beautiful ethnography over many years or conduct the most scientifically rigorous interview-based research, just as they don't need to be able to run regressions or conduct their own experiments in order, in order to have sufficient competence to just report those data accurately and not make obvious errors, in order to not confuse, say, correlation for causation, which was the kind of thing that used to happen, in order to appropriately describe the limits of an experiment, in order to appropriately describe the change in means as something different from the change in medians. All of that is just basic competence. It's not actually high sophistication. And what I'd like to argue is that we ought to elevate the levels of basic conference across the board when it becomes qualitative literacy. So how would I answer this question? What I'd like to do for the remaining however minutes I have is to offer three indicators I would use to distinguish those books as I described. There are far many more, but I can only talk about a few. And I hope that by discussing these three, I'll show you not just that we're talking about something actually quite distinct from thinking about quantitative evidence or evidence broadly or critical thinking, but also I hope to show you that the absence of this trait in our public discourse has been harmful for our democracy. So the first indicator. The first indicator is uh, what I'd like to call, uh, what I called in a recent book, someone to talk to, evidence of cognitive empathy, the ability to understand another person's predicament as they understand it. Um, when I look for, when I read a book, a qualitative book, one of the first things I see is whether there's evidence in the book of, of cognitive empathy. The term cognitive empathy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a minute to describe it because it probably sounds familiar, but it's probably not. It's certainly, it's certainly not what sometimes in the media even it's used to describe. So in this book, I, this is a book uh, based on a study of uh, how people made decisions in high stress environments. And so it's based on uh, graduate students in their first years of their PhD programs. <laughs> and, and how they decided whom to turn to when they needed someone to talk to. And the reason I picked them is I wanted people who, uh, over the course of a year, were going to have a lot of reasons to need to talk to somebody. Um, and what I found in this is that they made some decisions that were not always obvious, including talking to people they weren't that close to about deeply personal things. And repeatedly what came up is they often approached people when those people, uh, in their mind, could cognitively empathize. They didn't use that phrase, but that's what they were talking. In other words, I could tell that such and such was going to understand my experience as I understand it. What I'd like to argue is that a great interviewer and a great ethnographer is at a minimum a great such and such. In other words, that it is clear to the person being interviewed, to the person being observed, that that person understands their predicament as they see it. Not as the author perceived it ahead of time, and not as the author wished it were. And that sounds quite obvious, but as I'll show you in a minute, it's actually hard to see often in practice. Two things, cognitive empathy it's not cognitive sympathy. Um, I'm surprised about the extent to which these terms are confused repeatedly, even in the serious journals out there. Um, sympathy, you know, I might date myself at the moment, but you might remember uh, in some not too distant past, uh, in late night on television, they would have these shows where they, sh where they showed a, a young starving boy, usually in some part of sub-Saharan Africa, and they said, please write a check to help feed, et cetera. 
Now, if you wrote a check, what motivated you to write the check was almost certainly sympathy, not empathy. In other words, you felt pity or sorrow for the predicament of that person. You probably did not feel empathy unless you could understand what it felt to experience prolonged hunger. That is actually quite an important difference. One of the things I see repeatedly among the students I start um, training and in early ethnographers is they confuse sympathy for empathy. They spend a lot of time writing sympathetically about people in ways that tug at the heartstrings, that you feel bad for them, but ultimately end up painting one-dimensional pictures. I'll show you an example, as I said, in a minute. Another thing I'd like to clarify is that cognitive empathy is not emotional empathy. It's understanding people's circumstances as they understand it, them not necessarily feeling what they're feeling. Feeling empathy or emotional empathy is what Paul Bloom railed against in his book Against Empathy. So I'll give you an example. And I'm gonna use examples from highly sophisticated, strong journalists or researchers uh, because I want to emphasize how difficult actually this can be and how important this actually is to communicate in the public discourse. Here's a great example of a journalist who was explicitly seeking cognitive empathy, but ultimately pursued sympathy at great cost. This is a journalist in the New York Times who did a story, you might remember this from a few years ago, of this young man who was a neo-Nazi, and the story is called The Voice of Hate in America's Heartland. It's a powerful story, an important story, that ended up being really controversial. The story was so controversial that the journalist wrote a reflection on it uh, a week or so after the original story came out reflecting on the controversy the story had uh, created. And in that reflection, the journalist wrote, look, what I wanted to find out was this, why did this man, intelligent, socially adroit, raised in the middle class amid the relatively well-integrated environments of the United States military bases, gravitate towards the furthest extremes of American political discourse? Why did this normal-looking person, as the question goes, become a neo-Nazi? It's an important question if you think about it. Not necessarily for this particular person, but note among the many things that we fail to see was not just the, the success of Trump in the election, but the rise of white supremacy, which to many people seemed to just pop up out of nowhere. It certainly couldn't have popped up out of nowhere. What I liked about this piece is that Jonas was clearly skilled. He was asking an important question. We need to understand, I mean, whether you, whether you like the neo-Nazi or not, I hope you don't, uh, at least not their politics, we kind of need to understand where this idea has come from to avoid getting caught unawares yet again. What I also liked about the piece is that it eschewed an easy explanation. There was no story about how the guy had some bad childhood experience or something. In other words, there was no pop psychology. But there was also not the obvious, well, you know, no, there was a poverty background that explains the blah, blah, blah at an appellation. None of the pop sociology either. It's actually quite a thoughtful piece in that particular respect. In addition, the person spent a ton of time with the interview with the, with the respondent, with the family. So you think they did all that they would need to do. But again, they confused empathy with empathy. And as a result, this is how they wrote their story. They wrote a story in which, rather than trying to help us understand how this person thought, the journalist ended up trying to help us feel sympathetic towards this person. Again, confusing sympathy with empathy. Here's a, an example. Tony and Maria Hobarter, this is the young man. He, the young man is the focus, but his wife is, is part of the story in a limited sense as well. Uh, were married this fall. They registered at Target. This is, this is literally the story. They registered at Target. On their, last, on their list was a muffin pan, a four-drawer dresser, and a pineapple slicer. His tattoos were innocuous pop culture references, a slice of cherry pie. It wasn't apple pie, but close enough. Adorns one arm, an homage to the TV show Twin Peaks, which I guess is a popular TV show. He's a big Seinfeld fan, with the irony. Seinfeld's Jewish, this kind of thing. There's, there's more. The past, this is, this is the kicker. Of this, the, the kicker is what journalists call the end of the story. The, the profile has described this person and then comes back to the thing that they're supposed to be left with at the end. The past that was ready. Mr. Holbacher talked about how frightening it was this summer to watch from home as the Charlottesville rally spun out of control. Okay, important issue. Mr. Holbacher said he was glad the movement had grown. Important issue. They spoke about the future, about moving to a bigger place about their honeymoon, about having kids, just like any millennial. As you can imagine, 
uh, there was quite a bit of outrage. These are just a couple of the actual quotes in the New York Times report on the outrage. Uh, quote, how to normalize Nazis 101. One reader wrote, I'm both shocked and disgusted by this article. Here's another one. You know who had nice manners because the article talked about how nice Mr. Hovater seemed? Well, uh, you know who has nice manners? The Nazi who shaved my uncle Willie's head before escorting him into a cement chamber. And on and on and on and on. It could have been a really powerful, I think, opportunity to try to understand a population that I venture to say most of us don't understand very well. In an extended piece that could have actually quite, quite, could have had quite a bit of impact on how we understand extremism today, essentially degenerated into a political discourse in which people felt compelled to say, well, Nazis are terrible, you're denormalizing Nazis, et cetera. I think, it was a, I think it was a shame. Now the question is obviously, what could he have done? Well, I'll show you. Here's one of the passages in the book. Um, he writes, he mentioned books, this is the journalist writing, about obviously about Hobart. He mentioned books by Charles Murray and Pat Buchanan. He talked about his presence on 4chan, the online message board and alt-right breeding ground. Uh, quote, that's where the scary memes come from, he deadpanned. He spoke dispassionately about the injustice of affirmative action, about the malice directed towards white people in popular media, about how the cartoon comedy King of the Hill was the last TV show to portray a, quote, straight white male patriarch, quote, in a positive light, and on and on and on. This is the classic kind of statement that when I get a few notes of this kind and interviews from this kind from my students, I go, what were you doing? Um, he mentioned books by Charles Murray. What did he like in the books by Charles Murray? What did he find compelling in Pat Buchanan? What did he find in 4chan? What was scary about the memes? Which memes is he talking about? He spoke about injustice of affirmative action. Why did he think affirmative action was, this, was unjust? What was the malice that he saw towards white people? What was so good about King of the Hill? All of these are precisely the points at which you understand how the person understands their own circumstance. All gone. Now part of what's powerful about this and interesting about this is I'm sure that all of us in this room could come up with some explanations for some of these answers. We could come up with a pretty good account for why the guy probably didn't like affirmative action. And I'm sure the journalist could too. But that's the problem. The job is not for us to figure out what we think he why we think he'll dislike affirmative action, that's imposing our own preconceptions into the person. Our job is to figure out why he thinks it, why this individual we're talking to believes what he believes. It is at that point that we reach the point of cognitive empathy, which is just one simple indicator of a high quality, qualitative piece. I think it was a missed opportunity. That's one indicator. I'd like to talk about a second one. The second one is something, it's a term that ethnographers don't use, but psychologists use quite often, which is the idea that a good ethnographer is often attentive to our group homogeneity bias, which is the tendency that we have to think of our own group as diverse or heterogeneous, and our groups as homogeneous. We see this in a lot of places. So um, I went to college in Northfield, Minnesota, and for those of you who haven't been in Northfield, Minnesota, um, it's a very, uh, very, very, very Scandinavian Lutheran town. And uh, Carleton, which is a wonderful school, in many respects at the time reflected that. So a lot of the white professors confused me with other black students. Um, that was because the lack of exposure to an out group homogenized the group in their minds and made it hard for them to make distinguish any difference. It was all kind of one group. And I'm not saying they were racist. This is how everybody does some version of this. If you go to a new country, if you go to Sub-Saharan Africa, if you grew up in the United States, you go to China, you're gonna have a harder time distinguishing people from people who were already there, and vice versa. But it's actually a quite important trait. And part of the reason it's important is because one of the first things that happens to anybody who spent any time in the field anywhere is you start noticing heterogeneity. The more time you spend in the field, the more everything looks different. You spend time in two poor neighborhoods, the first thing you realize is how different those two neighborhoods are from one another. You spend time talking to two neo-Nazis, guess what? You're gonna realize, oh my goodness, yes, of course, they are both neo-Nazis, but guess what? They're kinda different. This guy really doesn't like, like Barack Obama. This guy was kinda okay with him. The more you spend in the field, the more you see heterogeneity, just as we all see heterogeneity in our contexts. 
Somebody who doesn't know much about the education field is like, ah, oh, they're all, you know, limp-wristed liberals or something. Uh, you go here, you're like, wait a minute, there's whites, there's, there's people from other parts of the world, there's, there's all sorts of heterogeneity. It's a natural impulse. And it's a natural impulse that the more you spend in the field, the more you're undermined. The more you spend in the field, the more you know a population, the more heterogeneity you detect. I saw an example of this. I first noted this when I, when I started studying poor neighborhoods. And by the way, I should be clear, you see other individuals as homogeneous, but also other neighborhoods as homogeneous, other organizations as homogeneous, and so on. When I uh, did a study of a high poverty neighborhood in Boston, in Via Victoria, the neighborhood didn't look anything like what I had gotten used to thinking poor neighborhoods were supposed to look like. Having read the very many wonderful ethnographies about poor neighborhoods in the, uh, uh, from the uh, Chicago School of Sociology, I had an impression of poor neighborhoods as places that kind of look like this. And if you've seen the television show The Wire, that's Baltimore, by the way. If you've seen the television show The Wire, and if you haven't, you should. This is a great show. Uh, it's actually even a great show ethnographically. What you see is actually neighborhoods. Uh, this is also Baltimore that actually look and, and feel very much like the neighborhoods I'd read about described in Chicago. Places that, as you might recall, in the important story by Will and Jules Wilson, had lost an enormous population, had lost people over the 1970s and 1980s, had become highly depopulated. Most of those people were middle class, but what was left was a high concentration of low-income individuals. And so what you saw in these neighborhoods, you can see it here, was evidence of depopulation, boarded up rooms, social isolation, et cetera. This is East St. Louis. Um, uh, this is uh, Woodlawn in the south side of Chicago. I love this picture because you can see uh, the foundations of buildings that were once there. This was clearly a place that once, just like this one, and just like this one, uh, had more people in the past. Now what's interesting is I started, I've done field work in, in many of these cities, not in St. Louis, uh, certainly in Chicago, uh, in Houston, uh, in Philadelphia, and um, and I designed a study where I decided I was gonna look just at neighborhoods that were above the standard poverty threshold, which depending on who you ask, is about 30% or 40% poor. So this is, for example, is a neighborhood that's about 35% poor. Uh, and so is this. Yeah. This, and I picked this photo because I think you can recognize it, that's the Apollo and that's Central Harlem. Um, the poverty rate of Central Harlem at the time this photo was taken, it's changing. Uh, the part that's not yet gentrified uh, is the same as the poverty rate here. And you cannot help but spend time in Harlem and Houston and Woodlawn and think, man, these places are completely different. And so when I see studies that describe poor neighborhoods in ways that eh, kind of sound like everything I've read before, I get really suspicious because I know that it's very hard to spend time in the field without seeing heterogeneity. In this case, about neighborhoods, but often about individuals. Now, how does this translate to the political discourse? I think one of the things that's fascinating about the conversation in the sociological scholarship on low-income African Americans is a lot of it reflects the same heterogeneity that you see in other contexts. I wanna show you, I couldn't resist, I wanna show you one figure uh, before, before I discuss what I mean by that. This is uh, from a, so I was very curious. I was very curious when I did this. I was like, well, is, is this weird or is this weird? Um, and so, right? And so I, I got data. And so what you're seeing here um, uh, is uh, in 1990, uh, every row here is one city, the 100 largest cities in the country. And what you're seeing on the left column there is uh, the proportion of poor neighborhoods that had lost people in 1990 over the previous two decades, and the proportion that had gained people on the right over the previous two decades. And what you can see here, and the darker the figure, the more neighborhoods are in that column. So what you can see here is that in the vast majority of neighborhoods, Sorry, in the vast majority of cities, the vast majority of poor neighborhoods had lost people in 1990. Literally, the thought experiment for this paper was, if you could walk and do an ethnography in every single city of the 100 largest cities and every single poor neighborhood, what would you see? Well, if you did that in 1990, this is what you would see, exactly what you saw in The Wire, 
and all of those great Chicago books. But, but I did my field work after 1990. Uh, and so I was curious about what would happen if you did that now. And this is what you would see in 2010. Yeah, poor neighborhoods are themselves more heterogeneous across cities than they used to be. Way more heterogeneous across cities than they used to be. Heterogeneity is kind of real. And the kind of the things that we were observing in the field work actually were consistent with what happened in a larger scale. But going back to the big point, I think there's a strong parallel between how sociologists and social scientists have written about poor neighborhoods and now in a lot of the media we've written about another population which is also considered and thought of as a monolith, which is the Trump voter. In fact, I'm not going to ask you to say anything. I'm just gonna ask you to think. Picture a Trump voter. Just picture a Trump voter. Now describe, <laughs> I'm seeing the hands cover. It's okay. <laughs> describe to yourself what this person's like. I mean, I'll tell you. Why? Racist, poor working class, would have put male, but we all saw the statistics that in 2016, 56% uh, of white females went for Trump instead of Hillary. Uh, so that's the only reason we don't put male. Uh, and I'm sure many of us are familiar with the statistic. Certainly the idea that they're voting against their own interest, certainly the idea that their voting was a reaction against the first black president, and certainly, I don't even have to say this one, that they're voting against immigrants. And there's a whole bunch of more characteristics about the Molinists. Now, I just wanna be clear, I'm not saying that every idea here is wrong, but what I'm saying is, the Trump voter is a homogeneous category. And what I'd like to say is that often in the media, the way we read, especially in the journalism that we take to be serious about Trump voters, we're essentially reading monoliths. There's tons of evidence of this, and because we don't have a ton of time, I won't give you a lot of it, but I don't think it's that actually hard to figure out. After all, it's where we get the idea of what the Trump voter is. But I thought what I'd do is show you an exception. Here's actually a very nice story the New York Times did on the women, and the women who helped Donald Trump to victory. This was one of the many uh, post-mortems that the media did after the election to figure out what the hell happened, or more accurately, <laughs> why did we not see this? Uh, this is the kind of story that should have been happening well before the election. And so what they did is they just, you know, go figure, went out and just asked people uh, <laughs> why they voted for Trump. Here's Daphne Goggins, she's 53, yes, an African-American female community activist and ardent Republican. And this is what she said. She said she believed decades of democratic efforts had done little for black people. When Mr. Trump invited her to, be a minority, to a minority outreach meeting, she told Trump tearfully, for the first time in my life, I feel like my vote is going to count. That's actually a really interesting idea. You can think whatever you want about her politics, but the idea that there might be a narrative among at least some middle-aged, thoughtful African-American women that voting in a particular way means their vote will actually make a difference because the Democratic Party tickets takes it for granted, it's actually an important idea that ought to have been part of the discourse from the beginning. There was more, and as you all know, she's not representative of the black women vote. That's not the point. I think it was 4% of African-American women uh, went for Trump, but about 26% of Latinas. Um, there was more, and they interviewed lots of women and showed this was a victory party and so on. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this is not an African-American. I've seen America fall down, this, uh, this woman, Ms. Ostendorf, is saying, and a big part of Trump that appealed to me was his business plan. Yeah. Okay, here's another person. I think, that the women see that, I think that women see the big picture. Women are smart, she says. The fact that he said something crude, and I don't have to tell you what she's referring to, I think everybody here knows, um, although apparently the president seems to have forgotten in his comments to Joe Biden. Um, the fact that he said something crude, she said, is not going to change my mind about the good he can do for our country. Think what you want about it, but again, this is the kind of thought we should have been hearing and understanding from before the election. Did I like that? No. But do I think he can do a better job than Hillary? Well, absolutely. Again, all of a sudden, the monolith just becomes a little less, a little less monolithic, a little less homogeneous. We start thinking in a little more reasoned way about what people are being motivated by. 
I think, by the way, this is the kind of work for which, of course, you can do quantitative work, but for which you also need somebody going out there and just talking to people about why it is they think about what they think. In 2016, as I've said, there's a paucity of this kind of peace. And everybody, everybody, everybody was caught unaware. Some people, oh, yeah, I knew it. Nobody knew it all along. We were all wrong. The political scientists were wrong. I was, everybody was wrong. Um, but here's what's interesting. Now we all know that we were wrong. What I'd like us to ask is, what are the biases that we have now that we're unaware of because we're not paying attention? I love what happened with respect to the Mueller or Mueller report. We're still not at the end of it. But the number of political candidates, pundits, Rachel Maddow, who began with the fact that he obviously colluded and then discussed the implications was actually quite remarkable. Now, we haven't seen the full report. And that is separate from the obstruction of justice issue on which I think the president is in much shakier ground. But it was remarkable the extent to which there was simply no debate over the obvious idea that he obviously colluded. I think. Whatever happens with that report, I hope we, as we did with the election, but no longer after the fact, start thinking about the eras in which homogeneous thinking, and particularly our group homogeneity about many of the populations that are part of the country, but not part necessarily of our political cir uh, um, uh, circuits, networks, um, are, are being interpreted, uh, are, are in our minds uh, more homogeneous than they really are. I'm gonna wrap up with a third indicator, which is an acute sensitivity to which kinds of arguments require qualitative data and which precise kinds of qualitative data. Really good researchers, that really good ethnography is going to be really careful about what you can say with field work, what you can't say with field work, what you can say with ethnography and what you can't say with ethnography. Now, if you, especially if you're a methodologist, you're probably telling yourself, well, obviously, everybody does this. And you know, uh, I'm going to say yes, but not really to this extent. And here's why. There's a very simple reason why. Um, if you are a statistician, an economist, a demographer, um, even a psychologist, working in the fields that many of us care about, in education, inequality, migration, poverty, etc., when you think of a paper and you write a paper, you don't really have to worry about whether an ethnographer is going to evaluate your paper. In other words, if you're an economist, you kind of have your economist audience in mind. That's what you're writing for. Not just economists, but what I'm thinking about the quality of the evidence and whether the arguments is persuasive, you can be pretty clear who's going to read it. If you're a demographer and you're running a particular set of regressions, some population projections, or whatever it is, you kind of know who's going to read it. If you are a psychologist, you better believe it's going to go to experimentalists. If you're a developmental psychologist, OK, maybe it might go to some developmental psychologists, maybe some demographers. But by and large, you kind of get it. If you're a statistician, obviously. But if you're an ethnographer or an interview-based researcher working in education, inequality, poverty, schooling, organizations, migration, you can rest assured that among your reviewers for your grant application, and among the people who are going to read your paper when, you, uh, when it goes out for review are going to be not just ethnographers, but also demographers and economists and statisticians even at times. In other words, you cannot rest, uh, except if you send your, journal, your paper to a qualitative journal. That's a different story. But I'm talking about the general discourse that many of us are a part of. You essentially are speaking to not just your methodological audience, but a broader audience. That's just the nature of the beast. That's just the way things are today. And as a result, you have to be extremely acute about what you can say and what you can't say. And sometimes, and I've, said, I've written about this, you end up making mistakes and trying to turn your, say, interview-based study into a kind of bad survey with not enough people and <laughs> do things that don't actually make a lot of sense. But, it's, but for experienced researchers, that sensibility ends up translating into your quality of your work. So that's what I'm referring to the fact that you have to be hyper-aware and hypersensitive because of the nature of the environment. And how does that affect things? How does that affect things? Um, I'll give you, I'll conclude with one example, uh, uh, which is uh, a, um, it's because it's, it continues the theme of the Trump voter uh, 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 along a line that I think everyone here has heard of, which is the supposed fact 
that Trump voters are voting against their own interests. Um, I'm going to set aside uh, whether you agree or disagree with that argument. I'm going to set aside whether it's possible for an external party to determine what is in somebody else's interest. I'm going to set aside even the Marxist version of that in which the interests are just economic interests and presume that it is possible for a third party to assess what somebody else's economic interests are. And I'm gonna set aside all of that debate and just focus on the narrow issue that matters for us today, which is the extent to which to make that client claim, you know what kind of data you need. Now, what, uh, one of the things I often talk about when I talk about the importance of both ethnographic research and interview-based research is that both of them get you things that you can't get through any other method, just as large-scale survey research gets you things you can't get through other methods and experiments get you things that you can't get through other methods. Uh, there are certain things you just have to see. If I had not been in those neighborhoods, I wouldn't have seen that the neighborhoods look really different depending on which one you're in. You just kind of have to go there. The census isn't gonna get you that. The census can get you certain things if you know what to ask for, but you won't even know what to ask for unless you go into the neighborhoods first. Uh, same thing with, if you wanna be completely convinced, well, let me, not, let me not get into the causal argument. Let's just say for certain kinds of argument, experiments are the only way, and for certain other kinds of causal arguments, there might be other ways if you're creative enough um, as a quantitative researcher. If you want to understand people's motivations, I'll give you an example. Um, I'll give you an example from a project I'm working on because actually this is quite important. Uh, you go home for Thanksgiving. You don't talk to your aunt. Uh, did you avoid your aunt on purpose? Did you just not think of anything to ask your aunt? Uh, did you just not run into your aunt uh, at a sufficient enough proximity for your comfort level to ask her something? The truth is, you can't actually just observe that because in the social interaction context, those three things are exactly the same thing. The only way you can, think, you can figure out what actually happened is by asking. You have to ask the person. There are entire classes of issues for which the only way to get at them is by interviewing, whether we like it or not. Now, you can interview and then do a large-scale survey, whatever it is, but in the first approximation, you have to interview. Were you motivated to talk to your aunt? Were you motivated to, uh, to avoid your aunt? You're gonna have to ask. There's just literally no other way of getting at it. Now, of course, when you do it, you have to do it in a whole bunch of ways. You have to make sure you have to take into account that people lie, blah, 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 we all know that, but you have to begin by asking. And I'm mentioning that example. I'm mentioning that example because going back to the idea of the kinds of data you need for the kinds of questions you, you're asking, I'd like us to think about this idea of whether the white working class is voting against its own interests. This is a very, again, a serious essay, and in many respects a really good one, in um, Political Magazine that tried to answer this question. And I'm mentioning this because the, the researcher was thoughtful. Again, I'm, I'm deliberately not picking crappy, quote unquote, uh, journalism. I'm picking actually quite good works. Uh, by thoughtful researchers and thoughtful thinkers and journalists. Now, what I love about the, uh, the piece is that it actually traced the origin of this idea properly to W.E.B. Du Bois. For whatever it's worth, Du Bois being in, in Black Reconstruction, being a good new Marxist, proposed that one of the things that was happening is that plantation owners, in order to keep wages low, drew a wedge between whites and blacks, deliberately describing whites as superior to the newly liberated blacks, uh, as a way of undermining potential efforts for black and white low wage workers to demand higher wages. It's a really nice argument that actually Du Bois was one of the first, he was the first to propose this argument that we often talk about today. The paper actually, you should look it up. It's very easy to find. It's a really good job. It's a 4,000 word essay, quite a long essay, 4,000 word essay of tracing the history of this idea. And the author concludes that working class whites are deriving psychological and citizenship wages by privileging race over class. Meaning that what's happening, uh, to put it differently, is that they're voting against their own interests, for example, for Trump, because they get psychological benefits from doing so, in this case, for elevating themselves as whites vis-a-vis -vis others. Now, this is an argument that I'm sure many of you have heard before, and some of you probably believe. 
Whether you believe it or don't believe it, I would like to set aside for the moment because that actually doesn't matter for the purpose of this particular conversation. Although it matters for the sake of our democracy. So you can talk about it if you want. But what I'd like to propose is that this is an argument in which the author is saying that people are motivated to vote in a particular way because they're getting a psychological benefit from doing so. And so presumably, to make this case, you've talked to whites who are telling you in some way, and they might not use the phrase psychological benefits from doing so, just as my graduate students didn't use the phrase because I'm getting cognitive empathy, but certainly there should be some way of inferring that from what they're saying about their motives. But here's what's interesting. In a 4,000 word major magazine essay, there was not a single interview with one, even one solitary white working class person about what motivated their voting. Now what's interesting about this is that I am certain that part of the reason it was published anyway is because the idea resonated with many of our political beliefs. But think about it this way. Suppose I wrote a 4,000 word essay in which I claimed that, um, take your pick, vouchers increase math scores. Uh, I'm trying to think of the most relevant and totally insane things to say without data. Without data. <laughs> that crime has gone up. Uh, that immigrants commit more crimes than natives. And I didn't present a single solitary piece of evidence relative, re relevant to that claim. In the first context, compelling experimental or quasi-experimental evidence showing that vouchers have a causal impact on math scores. Or in the second case, uh, a trend data on crime statistics demonstrating that in the United States, crime has gone up or gone down. Or in the last case, similar, simple comparative statistics showing whether uh, natives and immigrants have higher or lower crime rates than the other. I couldn't get that even in an op-ed. It's not plausible to do that today. It hasn't been plausible for a very long time because everybody has sufficient quantitative literacy to know that you can't make that kind of claim without presenting any data. And yet, even in a very serious magazine like Political Magazine, and it's a very serious magazine, and a thoughtful researcher, it was actually quite plausible to do this in the absence of any evidence from the people whose motivations you're inferring about the motivations you're inferring. For whatever it's worth, I think the reason I said it's a great piece is that it's a great piece if you read it, it's a completely different piece. If instead of being called as the white working class really vote against those interests, it were just called what theorists have proposed about how the white working class votes, I think it's awesome. It's a great historical account of what many theorists, beginning with the boys and up to the present, have said about how working class whites vote. Source of great ideas and a bunch of dissertations for somebody else to actually test. To wrap up, I know that I'd appreciate your, your patience. To wrap up, what I'm making a case is for, quali for, for qualitative literacy. I've just given you three indicators, but what I hope is con I've convinced you is that this is something that actually we have to think about. We have to clarify, we have to expand, that it's not just quantitative literacy and it's not just critical thinking. It's the ability to think rationally and reasonably about qualitative evidence. Qualitative evidence is evidence. Social science is qualitative evidence. To the extent that we haven't thought about qualitative evidence, we haven't thought seriously about social about one important aspect of social science. That we ought to cultivate it in ourselves and our students, and we ought to teach it to the future generations of thinkers, journalists, pundits who are going to be out there trying to inform other people how to vote. As I said, it's fundamental to evidence-based reasoning, and as I hope I've just given you some examples of, I believe it is critical for our democratic discourse. Thank you very much. as I make my, make my way to the stage. Remember, questions, send them to the, to the edges, and we will take your questions. Thank you, Mario. Of course. That was wonderful. Thank you. I'll get us started. OK. <laughs> um, so I think that was such a um, kind of compelling, insightful analysis. And I'm going to start with the question that's kind of burning most for me, which is 
You're talking about qualitative literacy yes. and the dimensions of qualitative literacy. And in the same breath, you're talking about what researchers should do and what journalists should do. Correct. Are they the same thing? Aren't these different types of work? And I want to keep in mind, the audience may not know, you have a journalist in your household. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My wife <laughs> is, in fact, a very good journalist. Um, yes, and that was on purpose. Um, so in some respects, it's not the same. Uh, a journalist, just as a journalist doesn't need to know how to run regressions uh, to report on data, uh, a journalist doesn't need to know how to do an outstanding ethnography. And just as a journalist uses quantitative data in a journalistic piece, in a book, um, the way they're using quantitative evidence is usually simpler and not exactly the same way that a quantitative researcher uses it. Um, but part of the reason I talked about both, um, not in the same breath, but essentially in the same talk, is because um, in both cases, I'm talking about basic competence. I think the journalist and the qualitative researcher and the quantitative researcher ought to be sharing a level of basic competence with respect to qualitative literacy that I see with respect to quantitative literacy. Mm -hmm. Everybody in this room, plus most of the really good journalists out there, will be able to spot in a second whether you're inferring causation from a correlation. And I think that's as it should be. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be able to necessarily run the regression for you, but that's fine. That's beyond the level of basic competence. What I believe is that uh, we're not even at the level of basic competence. In either. In community. either context. I think really good qualitative researchers, those are habits of thought you develop over many years, they're there. I think even outstanding quantitative methodologists vary dramatically in their level of basic competence about qualitative research. I do. And then this is not, this is not I really hope that it's very clear that this is not a quantitative versus qualitative mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I do multiple kinds of work. I just show you some, for example, quantitative results. Obviously, that's not the point. Mm -hmm. uh, the point is uh, we all get that we need to know basic math. I want us all to get that we kind of also need to know basic qualitative research if we want to understand how to read critically our political discourse. I think uh, the, the, the number of people who, um, let me put it this way, um, for that last piece, mm -hmm. it shouldn't have been publishable in the way it was. It should have been, it could have been easy to do, dramatically reframe, drop this idea of mm -hmm. understanding people's motivations and just talk about a history of an idea. Um, there is no possible way I can imagine that in a serious publication, the analogous error in quantitative work would have happened. And I think that reflects a lack of basic competence that's across the board. And I also think, I also think that if you gave that same piece to a random sample of sophisticated quantitative only researchers, I'm going to guess that not half of them would have also seen a problem with it. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. So wh why? Why is, why is qualitative literacy so scarce in your estimation? Yeah, I think it's a number of reasons. I think number one, the social sciences are young. They just are. You know, I, my brother is an engineer, mm -hmm. and uh, one time he heard me give a talk. And I, <laughs> and I gave a talk, you know, a classic social science talk about things we didn't know. And at the end, he just laughed. He's like, wait, so you guys don't even know whether poor neighbors are depopulated? I mean, the <laughs> kinds of things that they just take for granted, you know. And so anyway, we're, we're young disciplines. We're young disciplines. And in part because we're young, we're young disciplines, there's a lot of stuff that we just haven't worked out yet. Mm -hmm. um, I think a second more, more sort of particular reason is that uh, qualitative research is very heterogeneous. Quantitative mm -hmm. research too, mm -hmm. but qualitative research is very heterogeneous. It attracts people who have a, an, uh, a truth capital T orientation, mm -hmm. people who believe mm -hmm. that you can discover facts and your job is just to, to um, get as close to them as possible, mm -hmm. but also attracts lots of relativists, people who think, no, nope, all you're doing is uh, interpreting texts and, and words are texts. Mm -hmm. And there's no actual truth there. So there's a lot of heterogeneity right, that makes it difficult right, right. to, I think, clarify uh, the skills as needed. I think, so I think, and I think those are actually core reasons. This is part of why I'm talking about clarifying and cultivating as an important part of mm -hmm. this. Look, there's going to be people who say, no, excuse me, none of this matters uh, because that's not what 
that's not what qualitative research is. It is quantitative research is the research that's about evidence. Qualitative research is just about stories. Uh, and I mean, that, uh, that sounds like I'm, I'm, I'm putting down a perspective, but it's actually mm -hmm. a serious perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I don't think they'll like this. <laughs> is, is, our, is our training in the social sciences or in education in particular, our training around qualitative methods implicated in what you're seeing and what you're describing? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to do much better. Uh, and it, th that's not a, that's not, you know, I'm not wagging my finger. Mm -hmm. I'm saying we on purpose. Um, you know, I didn't, I hadn't always crystallized these ideas this way. Mm -hmm. um, frankly, not until last year. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've worked a lot to, to clarify qualitative mm -hmm. research, mm -hmm. but I don't think what we do as well as we could. Mm -hmm. And I think we don't do as well as we could because we don't reflect carefully, I think, on some of the most important parts of what we do, which is the extent to which we can convince ourselves that we're being reasonable. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of reflection on things that also matter, positionality, et cetera, and I think the last 20 years, I've actually seen a growth on that, which mm -hmm. is great. Uh, the critical turn has had an impact, but I think uh, on, on what I'm talking about, there hasn't been an, uh, an impact, and I think it matters. Uh, part of the reason I focus so much on journalism and the public discourse is that it doesn't just matter for writing better papers for the Sociology of Education Journal or whatever it is, but it matters for, um, for how we as a public uh, uh, convince ourselves uh, that we understand the world. Mm -hmm. I think we've convinced ourselves uh, in, in a lot of us who consume the mainstream media that we understand populations that are not often covered in the mainstream media because we didn't have the sensitivity to the data that would have made us more question, right. question those, those, that, that idea and those mm -hmm. reports uh, better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I feel like this was kind of implied in your talk, but you didn't talk about it um, explicitly. What, what is the role or what should be the role of social science in yeah. engaging with and shaping the public discourse? Because by one perspective, you might say that social science is about producing evidence, not kind of what happens with that evidence, yeah. or, or not to kind of muddy the waters with directly engaging public yes. discourse. Yeah. What, what would you? So, I mean, there's, I referred to this a little bit at the beginning. There's a way of thinking about the kind of work that we do as saying, look, our, our, our job is to show findings and to let the world figure right. out the find, do something mm -hmm. with the findings. Sometimes it comes across like policy recommendations or whatever you want. Um, I, I, think that's, uh, I think that's important, obviously, but I don't think that's necessarily the most important role we have. I think, it's as imp I think other roles are as important. Mm -hmm. Um, I think all of us who teach college students are teaching thinking skills. And this is, in my mind, a large class of thinking skills we're teaching poorly. Um, and to the extent that we think any other teaching skills matter, I think this ought to be part of it. I can think about it in the, in the sense of, um, again, in a parallel. You know, imagine, uh, imagine if our college students uh, didn't have to take statistics. Many don't. But imagine if none of them did. Um, the, 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 the newspapers would be terrible. Mm -hmm. the, okay. you know, they would be full of speculation and things that don't make any sense and ideas about crime going up. I mean, it would just be a whole mess. I, I'd like us to think carefully about what's happening because we don't teach qualitative reasoning. I think there are, you know, I read the papers with a red pen much more even than I did once I started becoming attuned to this because mm -hmm. they're just glaring gaps. So I think the educational function is important. Um, I think a third one has to do with maybe a combination of the two, you know. Uh, people like Sean Reardon and Ross Chetty have noticed something that they do quite well, which is that they're doing science, uh, but as you saw in the, in the graph earlier, they're reporting the results and also teaching you how to interpret the results. Mm -hmm. It's very subtle. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, they work a lot with the journalists who report on the studies to get the narrative right. Mm 
to help people understand how to think about distributions and think about uh, where to put yourself and think about what the data mean and don't mean. And I think that, that function is a teaching function that's mm. direct and I think it's quite important. Mm. I think they've, they've, these, those are just two examples, but they've done it really well. Um, I think there's a vision of that we can do. Mm. I think for those of us who write up results that we think journalists should care about, the joint function is working with the journalist on how to communicate why you're convinced of what you're convinced about. It's a way of merging these two functions that I think we could be doing much better. Mm. Good, thank you. Are there questions from the audience? Ah. Here they go, they are, they are indeed. <laughs> thank you. A lot of questions. <laughs> 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 Okay. Okay. Love the talk. And I'm going to assume these are pre-ordered that you all... <laughs> okay. um, love the talk, but why no mention of theory or epistemology? Don't they matter for the inferences researchers make? Yes. Um, they ma Of course. They matter a lot. Um, part of it is time. Um, in other words, time is part of the answer I didn't talk about it. Um, in a longer version of this talk, as in what I've talked about these issues and then continued in the conversation, I've added other things. Um, and one of them has to do with self-reflection. Um, mm -hmm. So if I were to add a fourth indicator, that would be one of them. Um, I don't because it takes a longer time. It's more involved. Um, but really good research is self-reflective in an important way. I don't mean necessarily that you're writing about yourself a lot. Um, and I'm not referring necessarily to all of the ethnography or any of that stuff, which is fine. Um, <laughs> that, that came out wrong. Um, <laughs> what I mean is, um, <laughs> reminds me when I was like, well, what happened was, <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> uh, Self-reflection, in the narrowest sense, simply refers to the extent to which you were thoughtful um, about what you were doing while you were doing it, and secondarily, reported that thoughtfulness in your work. Let's just assume that. And, um, and however, there's a much more extensive critique that stems from that that has to do with uh, the possibility of your even understanding the things that you are studying because your self-reflection has to, in part, be reflective or involve your position vis-a-vis -vis the people you're studying. Mm -hmm. And the hesitation I have is that that conversation can devolve mm -hmm. into things that I don't agree with, for example, well, you know, if you're white, you can't possibly understand blacks or this kind of stuff. I disagree with it, I'll just say it. Um, among other reasons, because that would also mean that there are things I can't understand uh, because of my position, and I don't really believe, I, can, I believe I can understand whites, mm -hmm. uh, for example. Uh, so anyway, so the point is, yes, uh, it was largely a matter of time. Yeah. Uh, and epistemology broadly, look, there is an issue. Um, I tend to be, uh, I guess, critical empiricist uh, in the sense that I tend to believe that there is a truth to be discovered. I tend to believe that we can approximate it. Um, I tend to believe that if you're not careful about your inferences, you are going to think you're approximating it while you're not. Is part of the problem, in quotes, with qualitative research is that it's primarily inductive, and that's mm. harder in certain respects than the more deductive quantitative research. Nice. Um, I don't think so. Mm. Uh, <laughs> nice it's a try, nice question, but, no. <laughs> but I don't think so. <laughs> um, and the, but, but only for, an, for one important reason, for two reasons. One is um, a lot of qualitative work is inductive, a lot of the much of the best ethnographic work is inductive. Um, much of my own work is inductive. Um, I teach a class on inductive qualitative research, mm -hmm. uh, but not all qualitative research is inductive. Mm -hmm. um, there are qualitative researchers who want to find out the answer to a good question they had ahead of time and about which they had a theory ahead of time. Right now, some, I hope, maybe if there are people thinking about this tradition topic, somebody's out there gonna try to find out whether People are voting for Trump because they're getting psychological benefits from <laughs> making that decision. 
And uh, that's a preset question, mm -hmm. and at least some rough preset theory about it. That's not inductive research, that's deductive mm -hmm. research in some respects. Mm -hmm. Not exactly mm -hmm. deductive like a, mm -hmm. an experiment is, but you know ahead of time what you want to find out. And so, mm -hmm. so that's why I, th I, think, I think no. Right. Um, okay. Qualitative research can be of both kinds. And by the way, so can quantitative research. Mm -hmm. A lot of Bayesian research, mm -hmm. Bayesian thinking is inductive in nature uh, in, men, in ways that are actually quite parallel to how you think about qualitative ethnographic evidence, data mm -hmm. collection and inferencing. Okay, this handwriting is a little challenging. <laughs> um, what might schools or teachers do or be trained to do most urgently? So kind of what's the highest priority is maybe the first yeah. part of the question. The second is, could newspapers build publics, the public's qualitative literacy um, just as their more sophisticated quantitative articles do. That's a great lift, lift renders opportunity to learn. Degree. So I think basically the question is, um, <laughs> uh, I I could w w what could happen to support the building of the qualitative literacy to, to better match what we see happen with quantitative literacy? Got it. And the first. So the first one was, what might schools or teachers do? Yes. Um, or be trained to do most urgently? What's the yes. greatest need? I would say that if I were doing this and you could only focus on one thing, I would focus on cognitive empathy. And mm -hmm. um, the reason I, I say that is I have never seen a great qualitative project in which the researcher did not attain this or communicate mm -hmm. it, both. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, you, if we go back to Max Weber, the idea of Verstehen, that's mm -hmm. ultimately what it is, understanding people's experiences as they understand it as they understand them. Um, so, so that's that answer. I mean, the other stuff is great too, but I would focus on that. And among other things, that is the kind of thing that with practice you can cultivate. Um, so to, just like in anything, you have to practice, uh, but there are things that you have to both practice and study. You know, uh, so to, to run regressions well, I'm just gonna go back to that example. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to teach you how to run a regression, and then you also have to kind of do it a few times, more than a few times to start figuring out, for example, to get to the point where you can tell whether somebody did something screwy. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, um, uh, and so everything is some combination of that, your own practice and mm -hmm. somebody teaches it to you. Mm -hmm. I think with cognitive empathy, uh, somebody has to teach you to look for it, but practice gets you really far. Mm. And so, uh, and in that sense, it seems to me like the kind of thing that would be lower hanging fruit than some other things that I think require more teaching relative to just practice right. than teaching a little with a lot right. of practice. Um, on the journalist point, I love that idea, and this is part of what I was referring to with my answer to the earlier, with my third point earlier, which is that just as Sean and Raj and all of these people, they do a, they do a great, you can, you can see it in mm -hmm. the way the the journalists write the piece because they, so I've seen both Sean and Raj discuss this, these findings. I've been fortunate to hear mm -hmm. some of these even in academic context before they wrote them up. And the journalists write the pieces the way Sean mm -hmm. right. and Raj right. describe them. Right. In other words, the kind of the habits of thought are reflected in the work. And so that's how you mm -hmm. can kind of tell. And I think, a good, I think that's a great space for ethnographers and interview researchers to do this, to not just say, look, you know, I, you know, I mentioned uh, Jeff Calar Jess Calarco's uh, lovely, really good book. Uh, she's a brilliant researcher. You don't have to be brilliant to do good work um, on uh, showing that working class uh, kids uh, learn from their parents to follow the rules and work hard, whereas middle and upper middle class kids learn from their parents to demand attention when they need it. And mm -hmm. so those mm -hmm. inequities and they get it reproduced mm -hmm. in the school context. So you can imagine her doing a version of saying, well, here are my findings, report them. Right. And right. you can imagine her doing right. a version of saying, you right. don't know, how, I'll tell you how I found this. Right. I was in this class and this happened. This happened early and this happened in the subsequent meeting and by the end of the school year, the teacher who was paying attention to everybody suddenly was only paying attention to. Do you see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? In other words, you mm -hmm. communicate the process for arriving at your conclusion, right. not just right. communicating your process. Right. This is something, by the way, going back to the point about what we can do as researchers, we ought to be doing more in our work. Mm. I've begun, I have Of framing our work for uh, the public. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Framing our work for the public and I think being explicit about where we got our findings. Mm. I, I'm still shocked mm. at the number of ethnographies where you read the thing and you would think that the person began with a hypothesis and then 
right. right. Ma magically, they went into the field and everything was exactly as they expected it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that never happens. You right. always change your mind. And right. um, I've made a, a, a habit in the last several books I've written to be very explicit about where every idea came from. Mm. Um, mm. Literally, wh why did I think of cognitive empathy and what mm. changed my mind about it? So a version of that, I think, is something we can actually do effectively. But, but on that and... note of how we, how we communicate our work to journalists and how we engage the public, isn't there a line somewhere? Like, where does, where does your framing of the research for a journalist become advocacy? Mm. Or where, like, how do, how, how do we stay mindful? Yeah. You know, what's interesting is, um, I, that is a kind of advocacy I like. Mm. So you can, you know, we often talk about, well, we don't often enough talk about objectivity and advocacy with respect to our work. Uh, but sometimes we say, look, here are my findings. I want to make sure that they're believable and they're objective and that I came in as an impartial observer so that people don't think that it was just my politics that dictated them. Fine. Uh, but I think an advocacy we actually ought to be doing more is Here's why you should understand that there was no way to answer this question except but by doing field work. Mm -hmm. and, and, and here's the kind of things you should be looking for to see right. whether I did this in the right way. Mm -hmm. I think we can do this. Yeah. I think we should yeah. do this. Yeah. I think this is part of the cultivating yeah. and teaching that I think we should do. Yeah, yeah. This is a good one. The, the three aspects of qualitative literacy seem to show up in cases when researchers or journalists allow their own preconceived ideas to preempt actually investigating the phenomenon. Is, is this a particular hazard in qualitative research versus quantitative? Mm. If so, why? Right. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, it's not distinct. Mm. <laughs> I, you know, uh, sadly, uh, um, it's a problem for everyone. Um, and you see it in the p-hacking scandal, for example. Mm -hmm. the psychologists mm -hmm. have the, and political scientists they all have the same problem. You know, you see all of these papers where, you know, significant tests, p-values all cluster around 0.05, because that's what the journals expect, which is implausible. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you see it in, uh, you know, the, the whole motivation behind pre-registration of hypotheses mm -hmm. uh, reflects the fact that the same biases can happen in quantitative research. So I know I think it can happen everywhere. I think part of I think there you know part of the issue we have is is professional you know there's a high degree of competition uh, students feel compelled to do this is more at the graduate level uh, and of course assistant professors but you feel compelled to publish more and more uh, make sure the results show up etc and so what ends up happening is the the pursuit of truth no matter where it takes you ends up taking a backseat to sometimes professional concerns sometimes you really you were upset about the election and you want to show that some things matter. Mm -hmm. I think that hurts us in the long run. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, I have this always in my own political beliefs. They're probably consistent with many of yours. But um, if my students can tell how I voted, I feel like I screwed up. Yeah, it did strike me in many of the examples that, that you gave. Um, many of the ideas were kind of just good liberal thinking that I personally <laughs> resonated with. <laughs> exactly. So it was the, the questioning of the things that we collectively get to take for granted. Exactly. And it seems like a, that seems like a particularly dangerous place. The things that we get to assume mm -hmm. and, and, and in a shared way that we're all kind of taking for granted together exactly. and agreeing upon. It's one, I mean, think about it this way. How is it possible that with the mass amounts of survey data and, and large-scale data, and the skill of interviewers, and hundreds of thousands right, of researchers, right, right. and pundits, and sophisticated thinkers, that everybody got it wrong on the election. Right. Right. You know, it's, 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 the amount of knowledge and capacity there is in the social right. sciences and political yeah. discourse today, the level of education, seriously, mm -hmm. the New York Times has PhDs, mm. these columnists, mm. all of this, how is it possible that we were in such a hermetically sealed context yeah. Yeah. that we did not see it coming. Right. Yeah. It, it's, it's, that, that's a problem. Right. I think it's a real problem. Yeah, and, and, yeah. yeah. in, in many kinds of ways. Right, yeah. so you're right. Yeah. I mean, I specifically focus on the kinds of things that we're all kind of inclined to believe on purpose. If right. I'd given this talk all based on Fox News examples, well, right. you, know, you would have just said, well, yeah, we well, could Fox say, how News. ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank goodness for the New York Times. You know, right. but no. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Actually, so we'll, we'll end with this question. It's a tough one. Yeah. Yes. Um, what are the differences between good journalism and good research? Mm. Yes. So there are a couple, and I'm, I'm obviously I'm assuming the question is specifically about qualitative research. Let's I'm take gonna, it that way. I'm yeah. going to take it that way okay. because we don't have a ton of time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, number one, a qualitative researcher has to go much deeper than a journalist needs to, um, uh, which typically means that the you know journalists work on deadlines. Yeah. Qualitative researchers don't work on deadlines. Number two, um, journalists report news, um, as in. If it happened yesterday, it's already not news. I'm exaggerating a little bit because there's long form journalism, but the, uh, the focus is current events. Um, and much of the most important qualitative research is not so much focused on events um, as it's focused on, well, trends or patterns or tendencies. In other words, things that are typically more stable. And I think that disposition alters everything. Um, well, not everything. You shouldn't alter the extent to which you take qualitative yeah. reasoning seriously. But it certainly alters how you're motivated. And this is, and, 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 and both of these things are important. You know, if we relied only on qualitative researchers right. uh, to report the news, nobody would know anything for like. <laughs> for a year after. Be like 2030, <laughs> in 2030, we'd be like, well, you know, I'm pretty sure <laughs> that, that Donald Trump might win. You know, no. <laughs> You don't, that, you, that doesn't work. And so once you begin with the understanding that you're looking for different kinds of things, then the depth and longevity becomes important. And finally, you know, um, uh, a journalist has a word limit. This is a time limit, but a word limit. There's only so much you can say in 500 words, 1,000 words, 3,000 words. Uh, so your job is to not screw up on the evidence side, right? right. Um, uh, not to give us completely overwhelming evidence of your point, which is, right. should be your job in a qualitative right. research context. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. That thank was you very so much. insightful. <laughs> so with that, I remind you to take your tickets and invite you for food and drink next door. Okay. That was fun. That was super fun.